everyone, and welcome to the November 17, 2020 Ordinance Review Committee. Um, this meeting and all who participate in it with us on Zoom will be audio and video recorded. Uh, first thing, roll call, Laura. Sure. Um, Councillor Nash. Uh, present. Here. Councillor Labarge. Present. Councillor Thorpe. Here. Member Peck. Here. And Member Napolitano. Uh -oh. I see him on the list, but I think he's muted. I can't. He's not in his chair. I can't make eye contact. Oh, he's not. Okay. Hmm. So I guess we'll have to count him as absent on roll call. But I'll note yeah. that he arrived whenever he presents himself. Okay. So I will move into public comment. Public comment. We will begin, as always, with public comment. If you know you wish to make a public comment, please use the raise hand feature. To raise your hand, you click on participants in the horizontal menu bar at the bottom of the screen. A column will open with the participants of the meeting. The raise hand feature is at the bottom of the column. If you're calling in by phone, you can raise your hand by hitting star nine. If you're having trouble raising your hand, you may use the chat feature to send a message to me. I will do my best to monitor that for people having technical difficulties, but that is the only purpose for which we will use that function and only be used during public comment. I will unmute each raised hand one by one and ask if you would like to make a comment. When you begin, please state your name and your city or town for public record. We do not respond during public comment as it is your time to speak. So while your comment should be directed to us, you will understand when we don't respond. Due to the size of the meeting that it is public and how remote participation work, all participants will need to be muted until called upon. I also ask that all but the committee members turn off your video until called upon as comments are directed to the committee members and only the person recognized has the floor. We will do our best to act quickly if someone is clearly acting in a way that is inappropriate, deploring profanity or slurs, and we'll remove anyone that needs to be removed. I will remind people that we are always happy to receive comments by email, which are equally part of the public record. So please email us at citycouncil at northamptonma.gov. Thank you. Okay, next. Anyone want to, I see a hand raised, Tay. Hey, yeah, my name is Tay. I use hey. they, them pronouns. Um, and thanks everyone for being here tonight. I'm coming back with um, more, more demands or the same demands from unhoused people and unhoused organizers in Northampton. Um, and I think that this group has a really special and powerful role to be reviewing ordinances and proposing new ones. Um, and I think that I'm going to start with three that I believe need to be reviewed or repealed is Northampton needs to immediately legalize temporary structures and tents in public and repeal that camping ordinance so that it doesn't continue criminalizing unhoused people for existing in public as the only option for being unhoused. Um, and then also Northampton needs to stop criminalizing and harassing unhoused people who are panhandling or asking for money on the street without a permit. Um, it does nothing but impinge on daily survival needs of unhoused people while offering no real solution for how to get the survival needs met. And then this also follows through with that is we have banned the, the ban the box law in Massachusetts, but doing something to enforce that law because if people can't, anybody with a, back, a criminal background um, who has re-entered can't get a job in Northampton due to that most of these jobs are still barring people and having the question if you've ever been incarcerated or have a record on um, applications. And then creating a pa and passing a fair chance ordinance for to limit the use of criminal records by private landlords um, in Northampton when screening tenants because that also blocks out unhoused people from the private sector. Um, and then the alternative is a two to five year long affordable housing wait list. Um, so yeah, and then also to create an ordinance banning the selling of public lands and buildings gifted to the city to private developers um, immediately because there are public buildings that have been gifted and that are sold immediately to 
private developers and then we excuse um, that we don't have an option to build affordable housing when that's not actually true. And then lastly, Northampton to create an ordinance that imposes penalties and incentivizes against the maintenance of private property vacancies. Um, I know that there's a bunch of vacant private properties that the town has tried to work with private landlords to give up or to rent out and that hasn't worked. And a lot of other cities have created ordinances that um, incentivize against um, using or keeping properties vacant. Um, and yeah, so all of these would change houselessness in Northampton in such a big way um, and would make the, the path to housing and to jobs way more accessible and way more easy without solely relying on social services that aren't getting a lot of this done. And I will email all of you all of these options and they each have cities that have made these ordinances possible um, at, as examples as well, so that this has been done before and this can be done fairly easily. Um, thank you. Thank you, Tay. And your city or town for the public record? Oh, Hadley. Hadley, thank you. Anyone else for public comment this evening? <laughs> Seeing no other hands, we're gonna move on. The public comment is closed. We're gonna move on now to the approval of minutes for November 2nd, 2020. Move to approve. A second. Motion made by Councilor Barr, yeah. seconded by Member Peck. Um, any discussion? Any discussion on the approval of minutes for of November 2nd, 2020? If no discussion, everything is fine. Laura, roll call on the approval for the approval of minutes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor Thorpe. Yes. Member Peck. Yes. And Member Napolitano. Yes. Okay, that's been approved. Moving on now to suggested ordinance changes, uh, not yet referred to the city solicitor. Are there any, Laura? There are not on this for this agenda. Okay, moving on now to the discussion with the Northampton Housing Partnership. And I am grateful that tonight we have Keith Benoit and Carmen Juno here to talk about the housing stability notification, so. Yeah, I'll, I guess I'll start. Uh, so Keith Benoit, Community Development Planner for the city. I'm on the staff, um, staff person for the housing partnership. Um, so this act, um, this um, proposal is something that Somerville did last year before the pandemic. Um, and basically what it, what it says is that landlords um, of rental units or uh, people foreclosing on a house, they have to, at the point of a notice to quit, which would be the start of the eviction process, they have to give a list of resources, financial, legal, for to help their tenancy. So, you know, in Northampton, we have RAFT and IRMA, which helps with rent or utilities or uh, mortgages, um, and then a list of all sorts of legal resources, which are, you know, simply some of them just simply just laying out the eviction process. Hopefully, no one has ever experienced eviction, but you know it is a scary process, and um, you know we we find that um, tenants often do not have a lawyer, and ninety percent of a of a landlord would at at, at an eviction hearing. So, uh, and there is resources now that the state has. So. Um, Boston moved quick on this, um, this law during the pandemic. Um, and so I took a lot of language from Somerville. Um, they have their own department that is just housing stability. Uh, so there's a lot of support there, um, mm. but they're, they're seeing more. Um, uh, and I did talk to Somerville, um, uh, the housing stability coordinator in the city. Um, and 
because of the state moratorium, they had not seen really the effect of this yet, seeing how well it played out. Um, but the idea is that we're going to try to do everything to keep people in their houses. Um, and this is one way, you know, uh, most people have never been to a soup kitchen. Most people have never had to use, you know, back on their rent or have not been able to pay their rent. So this is one way, you know, one stop gap. Um, so I sent uh, Laura and some of you on that email, I, I forwarded my draft and I guess um, the Ellen from Somerville, she, she is a lawyer by training. Uh, I mean, she says that, you know, the only legal argument that she could think that someone might say from a legal standpoint is that it's, you know, forced speech. Basically, you know, at this point, um, how I would see the ordinances, the, the resources would be on the Northampton webpage. It's a PDF and you just go there, find it, download it, and you can forward that or print it off for the tenant. Um, but it's, and then the enforcement, the, that's the other side of that, that we have not played, that we have not dialed in because um, understandably um, the health department, um, they're very busy right now with evictions, or I'm sorry, with you know, all the health things with the pandemic. Um, and, you know, we're looking at either the health department or maybe the building commission being the enforcement, which I would be able to find, you know, the first time would be a warning. Each additional um, kind of thing after that would be a, a fine of some sort. Um, so that's my primer, but I welcome any questions. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, did you want Carmen to chime in or to, to, to go in or should we wait until afterwards? Uh, you know, Keith, how did you want to, I know you're yeah. both. Yeah, uh, Carmen wants to speak about it. I mean, I think uh, uh, she definitely has a voice, but we also have, I don't know if she's more, um, you know, engaged with the other, the other items on the list. So. Okay. Yeah, I mean, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so yeah, I was sort of studying up on the different, um, uh, proposals for uh, changing the ordinances for, for housing. But I will just add one very quick thing. At our housing partnership meeting this month, November 2nd or whenever it was, we heard about a situation where a young couple uh, went through a rental agency, paid a high you know, kind of rental fee for their apartment, got into their apartment. Five days later, a week later, the, the woman found out she was pregnant. They immediately told the landlord the landlord then said to them, well, you've got to leave because I don't accept children. They not knowing uh, that they had a recourse and resources left uh, and looked for another apartment. They asked the rental agency for their uh, broker feedback and the rental agency said no. So this is why I think education to tenants and landlords about these kind of resources is so crucially important. People just do not know. You're right. Thank you, Carmen. Mm -hmm. Members of the committee, questions? Megan. So, um, speaking of education, I, I know that that notice of rights um, is something that- I can't hear her. Can't hear you. Is this better? I'm muted. Mm. Hi, is this better? Very low. Very low. I'm really not sure what's going on. Um, I can hear you. I just have to turn up my volume. Uh, so the um, the notice of right that you're that you mentioned, that's educational an educational pamphlet. Is that under development right now? I think um, Mr. Fiden mentioned that last time in our last. Uh, Yes, um, um, uh, two members of the housing partnership, Gordon Shaw, uh, who's, a, who's a lawyer by training and working in law, and then another member, Jim Brees, they had worked on a list. Um, I had also pulled some from the state and uh, um, I think from the city of Somerville um, and just 
some of it is, is specific to different places, but some of it's statewide. Um, but I think before I, before I would be comfortable kind of sharing it, I wanna go over with the fine tooth comb, make sure the details are there and make sure it makes sense. And whether that is, you know, different resource, you know, one PDF for both uh, renters and um, homeowners or previous homeowners or, or um, separate, um, yeah. Essentially, would be kind of distributed or? Yeah, I think the, the best way is one, we gotta let people know that this, if this was passed, is that this is now a new, new ordinance. Uh, you should follow it if you're a landlord. So having a list of landlords and either email or print out, although printing uh, can get costly. Um, so we wanna try to limit that. Um, and then put it on the webpage um, and, and let them know that you know every time you do a notice to quit that you need to you need to hand this out and I think part of that is not just a email blast to the landlords but you know like a Facebook or however we get the word out in the city you know I would like to recommend at some point if that could be translated you could at least translate for the you said, you said uh, translate into Spanish. Yes, good idea. Yeah. And thank you for the column yesterday, excellent column yesterday in the Gazette. Yeah. That was the work of Carmen and her her group. Um, I only submitted it. But yeah, it was it was good. Megan, you're all set. I have another question I'll ask later. Okay. You're going to ask later? Okay. Councilor LaBarge. Um, no, I was just going to tell Megan I couldn't hear her, but it's better now. <laughs> okay. Did you have a question, Councilor LaBarge, or that you're all set? Um, no. I think I had read an article. I'm pretty sure it must have been on the Gazette where a meeting was, was held with Housing Partnership. And it was brought up, correct, Keith, of what they were talking about with the difficulties of people with mortgages, if not with apartments. And I thought that was an excellent, excellent article. And I have several friends um, here in the city and even family who are attorneys. And it was excellent because this has been going on for such a long time. And even in Ward 6, I have helped many people with renting and also their own mortgages and the discrepancies that they had to go through. It was ridiculous. Thank you, Councilor LaBarge. Councilor Nash? <laughs> Look at, you can't hear him though. <laughs> What's he saying? You, Jim. Oh, here I am, I'm, I'm talking to Megan about her sound <laughs> and I'm unmuted. Uh, Megan, I'm just wondering if there's something around your keyboard that might be covering up your microphone. I can never figure out where the microphone is on my machine. But, um, anyway, my question is for Keith that, um, so this is a draft ordinance uh, or this eviction notification notice ordinance that's being worked on right now. And um, that, um, could I, I would, and, and, and when do you expect to share a draft of this ordinance with, um, with counselors or other committees or is it, is it somewhere we, where we can look at it? Uh, I did send it to Laura and uh, there's Megan, it was on the email, I believe. Uh, I don't think you oh. all were on the email, um, uh, but I can also, if you- My apologies then. Yeah, I can, I have your email, I can send it to you as well well i'm um, sure if it went to laura that she sent it to me okay. and, and, to and I'll, I'll be i'll be i'll be taking a look right now hold on i think sure. i forwarded it earlier i'm yes. sure you did laura laura could you send that 213 to jim it was forwarded at 213 this afternoon <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh there it is okay thank you Right, I'll be looking this over while people are people are talking. I can't okay. know how to get into it. Jeff, 
Napolitano. Any questions? Nope, I'm good. No? Okay. So, Keith, how, Keith, I'm just going to ask you a question. How long has uh, Somerville had their ordinance in effect? I believe they voted on it in December of 2019, um, and it was 30 days after that. Um, and when I talked to Alan from Somerville, they had not really had to enforce it, I believe. Um, they said they had a lot of big landlords that um, were on board with it, um, but she seemed to think that because of the eviction moratorium and then uh, that they weren't gonna see some, but that she was expecting the smaller landlords to put up more book like to, okay. you know, to not yeah. wanna do it. Hmm. Okay, thank you. And any other members have any other questions? No? I see Megan's hand. Megan? I can't see Megan. Hey, Megan. <laughs> What's happening? <Is> You're on. <laughs> okay. Um, Keith, I wanted to ask you, since you brought up the... Um... Still having a problem. I really don't know what else to do. Um... Something's wrong with her, video, with her sound. In, but, in, the but, main, in the meantime, if you turn up your volume, you should be able to hear her. I can hear her fine. My volume is up entirely. I just turned yours up. You're good. Okay. So, um, Keith, I wanted to ask about the, the you brought up the, the sort of the pushback from some I of the- I can't hear her. Yeah, your volume's already up all the way. And but why are we not hearing her? She's got an issue. I don't know what it but is. Keith is saying he can hear her. You can't hear me? I can hear her. And I can hear her. So, can you Jeff, you Jeff, can you hear her? I, I can hear. It's uh, Megan's mic is a little bit lower than everybody else's, but I can hear. Okay, then I'll shout. Um, so, Keith, um, I can push back from some of the landlords. Um, and I, can, I can understand that because this ordinance asks them to assume most of the, the costs of this. And, um, you know, there might be some fees, I don't know, even associated with like serving those notices. But um, Boston's ordinance, there was a stipulation that this eviction notice of rights also be sent to the city agency that will be enforcing it. So at the time of, that the notification is served, um, do you think, I mean, has that been discussed at all? Yeah, so um, in my initial draft, I did include that. So basically, I would have said notification to planning and sustainability, and then the enforcement would be on either building commission or the health department. Uh, but Wayne, in his infinite wisdom, said that, you know, if we're going to do that, then that's, um, uh, that would mostly fall on me, and my position is 100% funded by the CDBG grant. So there would need to be some sort of finagling, which I don't know, understand yet um, for that. And if it's, so he was, he was concerned about one, the, the cost of that, um, but also what would it do for us if we just get notified and someone else is um, going to do the enforcement. Um, and, you know, I think, it, you know, for like the housing partnership or, or other people in the community that um, might be interested in how much evictions are happening, uh, well, then, then that information would just lie in the enforcement as well. So uh, there's, a, there's just a question of what does it do for us if, if we were just to get notified. What about, what if the building, what if the building department, the enforcer, that's kind of a heads up when the eviction notice is served. It's kind of, it's kind of okay. Yeah, I mean, that's, um, I, I guess that's the, the, the same question, you know, um, you know, administrative. I, I, yeah, just more administrative. Um, and if we're not gonna do anything, if I'm not gonna do anything with it other than just know that that's happening, 
Um, but if he, if you know, the, whoever the enforcement agency is, if they're already keeping track of it, then I can just go to them and say, hey, how many of these have you served um, in the last three months or something? On the current, yeah. yeah. How can we get into John? Can you? To chat, John. Megan, are you all set? I'm working. Quick question. I hope. What is summary process action on this part? What does that mean? I couldn't hear the question. Could others? Uh, I believe he was asking yeah. about the summary process, which is usually done in the housing court, um, if I'm not mistaken, about that process. Sure, I can probably help with the eviction process if somebody needs to know about that. Thank you, Attorney Seawald. <laughs> I, I, but I didn't hear the question because I'm also uh, having trouble hearing, Megan. I was just curious about the, the possible legalese summary process action that was on the draft. If that was, if there's a quick answer to that, otherwise I'll. If the, uh, about the process of summary process? I, I don't know, this, this phrase summary process action, I. Okay, summary, so there's, so the state law provides the exclusive means from, for removing a tenant from uh, the residents, uh, or uh, and and so we're talking mostly here, I believe, and I didn't really have a chance to go through this in any detail because I didn't see it until recently. But um, but it, there's only one way to legally evict a tenant from a residence, and that is through something called summary process, and it's a lawsuit that takes less than a month to get through. At the end of which, you should have a, a decision. Doesn't always work that way, but that's the idea behind it. Uh, and so there's very, very specific steps that a landlord has to take in order to terminate a tenancy and then to initiate the court action either in in housing court or in district court. Um, now I think it's all in housing, but I haven't done this work in many, many years. But um, so that's the process. Don't worry about the phrase. It's a it's sort of a term of art for removing a tenant from property. While I have your attention, I, I, I don't want to be the wet blanket here, but I do want to say that, uh, that the process of eviction and the process of foreclosure is very, very specifically detailed in state law. And I can't tell you that a court reviewing a fine issued against a landlord for not doing this would be upheld because you are uh, in an area of law that is very, very specifically detailed in state law. And the question is whether there's any place for the city to supplement that law. Um, you know, the, the standard is that we could not do anything that's inconsistent, that defeats the purpose of state law. But there are some state laws that are so comprehensive and so specific that they, in, they, they uh, suggest that the legislature was intending that the process be the same in every community. Taxes, we can't have separate taxes. We can't have separate contract law. We can't have our own you know, tort law. So um, I'm just putting that out there as a, uh, you know, as a warning that while I'm not opposed to going forward on this, I just want you to know that it's not for sure that this is something that a city or town can actually do. Attorney Seawald, thank you for that. And uh, that, that might, what you just said, might actually go into, um, when we go into discussion on the fair chance ordinance, what he just mentioned could also, you know, um, between the state law and uh, federal law could impact how we move forward with that as well. So thank you, Attorney Seawald. Can I ask a question? Yes. 
um, just um, presumably Cambridge and Boston are both, or no, Somerville and Boston are going to run into the same problem uh, with state law. Um, so if if it does affect <clears throat> us passing it, it'll the same thing will happen. They'll have to contend, or maybe they have contended with this issue already, right? Well, honestly, no. But but it would be great for them to get get the chance to decide it, and not not for us to get that chance. <laughs> And, and I, and because it's basically insisting that um, landlords inform people of their rights as opposed to interfere with the process, isn't it more likely to be feasible, legally feasible under Massachusetts law? Because it's not like creating a se separate system. It's just saying you have to actually tell people what state law is. I, I think that as long as we don't affect the, uh, the actual eviction process through this and we're just fining I think we'll probably be okay. I just, you know, I, I just want to put the sort of the my, my concern out there, and I'm not suggesting that we don't go forward. The worst that could happen is that a court says you can't do this, and we don't do it. Uh, but I'm, you know, it's not like I'm worried about liability or anything like that. I just want you to be aware that there are limits on what we can do uh, when we're dealing in areas of state law. Uh, Jeff, just to uh, reiterate, this is um, will be at the start of the eviction process, so I believe notice to quit is, is 30 days, so there is some time, um, and unfortunately right now Raft and Irma and some of these other things are taking longer than 30 days, so it, it may not be as fruitful as, as we anticipate. Wait, um, can you expand upon that? Why would it not be as fruitful? Uh, there are so many people going through Wrath and Irma, um, trying to get financial resources uh, through the state, that there's a backlog. Um, so. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I had I had made this comment um, at the last meeting when I he initially heard about this. Is it just that, um, in my experience, actually canvassing people who were who were um, facing eviction and foreclosure in in Springfield, that just by virtue of them knowing what their rights are, they're more likely to. Um, not just abandon their house immediately because there's so many people I've actually personally mm -hmm. encountered um, who either were considering or know people or you know in the organization that I worked with knew people who just left because they got a single threatening notice and didn't realize that only yeah. a judge can kick them out of their house. Um, and so yeah. I, in, my, my, in my perspective, even, I mean, regardless of the, the interfering with the, the, you know, the, the legal process, just letting people know what their rights are and that they don't don't have to leave just because they get a, a mean, an angry letter from their landlord um, is in and of itself valuable. Can I add to that, Jeff? Um, part of this notification is- um, Here we go again. Yeah. It's offering a list of uh, agencies. Um, and I talked to the Secretary of Service that we can get that piece so much easier. People who are anticipating eviction prior to eviction, and so this is this is part of that. Giving them the time to plan ahead and possibly avoid it, and you know, service that and other support organizations will help them kind of you know, link them up with a network of friendly, friendlier landlords, you know, and connect them to financial management, other kind of support programming. So, yeah, I, I do think that education is, is here and um, seems relatively low cost for, for cities and for you know, landlords, but yeah, of course, we have to understand what the interactions are with state law and there are other municipalities who have implemented this already that we can learn from. All right. Are you all sick, Megan? Yes. Okay. Nash wants to say something. Cou Councillor Nash. Yeah, first, I just want to say how disappointed I am that I'm not hearing everything Megan's saying. I know, I'm not either. She's so prepared tonight, and I, I'm picking up I'm picking up little bits of it, Megan, and I appreciate and and um, and very thoughtful as usual. But I'm I'm missing 
uh, pieces of it. And um, you can see me holding the computer to my head. Do you hear you? <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to shout here. And oh, that's is, better. As long as it's as loud as I get. I know, you're good. I would say just look at Laura's minutes. They are <laughs> thorough and <laughs> they help me so much before every meeting. But I will can wait till Laura's minutes to find out what you said. Okay. That's... I'm afraid I'm missing some too. I'm it's more a little bit intermittent. Yeah. So uh, what I wanted to say was so so what we're looking at here is um, a um, an ordinance that is going to require that landlords, when they're notifying somebody they're going to evict them, to also share with them a list of resources that they can, um, that that tenant can uh, look to, to help them through the ev eviction process. Am I understanding that correctly? That is correct, but also homeowners. So if you are being foreclosed on. Oh, um, okay. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. And that my, and to, um, <clears throat> Uh, Attorney Seawald. So we've done uh, additional notification uh, around uh, zoning. So one of the you and I, uh, Counselor uh, Attorney and I, have talked about the the way that um, the zoning law. When we make map changes, the only people you really have to to inform of map changes for zoning are the people whose properties are affected. We've actually written into our ordinance that um, that the abutters need to be um, advised of this as well. So it it seems like this is something we've done before, um, and that it's it's what we're really just calling for is better notification. better notification and uh, better awareness of resources. And I, I can't I, I think that's a great idea. So, Councillor Nash. Uh, the example you're citing is the city giving notice. The Correct. city can put put that on itself, but now we're putting the requirement on a third party, and that's different. Well, attorney, <laughs> <laughs> but also it that that the uh, planning department, in terms of in terms of when there's a special permit, the um, that the the um, the responsibility of contacting abutters and people within 200 feet, the planning department asked the, um, the person with the proposal before the planning board to actually do that notification. So we've done Illegal. that. Illegal. No, no, that's wrong. Absolutely wrong? not. Since 1935, the Supreme Judicial Court said that the city or town has to do the notice and we always do the notice. The applicants do not do notices for special permits or anything like that. It's illegal, totally. I guess I'm wrong then. <laughs> as rare as that occasion is, you in this. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Nash. Do you have any other questions? Can I just make a, a point just um, regarding what Councillor Nash um, was was saying or pointing out? I just it's just useful to point out that. Um, Landlords actually can't evict their tenants. It has to be done by a judge. That's the big, that's the one big takeaway is that even if a landlord just wants to evict somebody and that's, that's, that's the big takeaway for me, at least in doing all this stuff is that it really is up to a judge and not necessarily a landlord. Thank you, Jeff. Any, any other questions? Keith, I have a question. How far out before you really want to introduce what you're proposing regarding with this ordinance? How far, you know, you're, you're pretty far along with it from what I see. Um, when do you plan on really introducing it? Do you have a time frame in mind? So this is all this, this whole process is all new to me. Uh, I've only been working in the city since COVID. Um, I think I need, we need to dial in the, um, enforcement and uh, I had uh, sent this over to uh, Meredith in the health department uh, and she she was very busy um, and I just asked her, you know, do you have the bandwidth to take on more um, enforcement? Um, but John Flagg and the building commission 
Um, he said he would be willing to do it, but he believes that the health department has more teeth to enforce this. Um, so at, at some point I need to have a conversation with them two together, or uh, probably with Wayne as well, uh, what the best course of action is, the enforcement side of it, and then notification, how much of the planning department, if at all, we want to get involved. Um, so that's all separate from my other work, which is, uh, you know, we got CARES Act, a third round of money. So we're trying to get an action plan, which should, it's probably, it's a higher priority right now, unfortunately, um, to get this money out the door, which might include um, things like uh, rental assistance. So, I, I uh, yeah. Probably after the first of the year, I, I, I'm assuming. Okay, so I appreciate that because you know the work we're doing, you know, making recommendations uh, regarding specific ordinances. This falls in line with um, something we could possibly recommend in our report. So it'd be great if you kept in touch, or you know, we keep in touch with you as to how we can best um, work with each other on this. So yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Councilor Labarge. Oh, thank you. I've been waiting a while, but anyways. <laughs> Um, Keith, who is do who's helping you with the language? Is our city solicitor helping you with the language on these ordinances that you're designing? Uh, I have not uh, sent him this uh, ordinance. I, like I said, I, I pulled most of it from a combination of uh, Somerville and, and Boston um, and tried to take out the, the legalese as it were, and make, make it more straightforward. Um, but no one has uh, helped me with it, no. Are you going to have them look at it at some point or what? Yeah, that's, uh, uh, if that's part of the process and I don't want anything going out there that has not been combed over. <laughs> right. I, Alan, I have a question for you, please. All right, say that this ordinance is going to be designed and I'm hoping that we win on it. I really do. But if it's a state law that we're talking about, shouldn't a senator also, like we encourage a senator to help us with a bill like this or an ordinance? No, we're not attempting to change state law. We're trying to add uh, local law to the state law. So no, uh, the state legislators would not be involved in this. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? I can't see everyone. Councilor Nash, are you all set? I can't, can't see. Jeff, are you all set? Okay. I'm good. Okay. Well, Keith, Carmen, I thank you very much for being here this evening, and you're more than welcome to stay and join us as we move forward in the rest of our uh, process here. But I, I appreciate all the uh, uh, you know, work you've done and that uh, you came here and you took the time to come here and speak to us this evening. It's, it's, it's uh, greatly appreciated, and I look forward to our continued conversation as we move forward. And you know, we have a, a report to present um, that gets submitted to the clerk and the clerk submits it to the mayor and to the city council. Uh, but, you know, definitely this would be something that we could look at and possibly add as one of the recommendations to, um, you know, the, the uh, mayor and to the council. So thank you very much. Can I say one thing? Yes, Carmen. Um, so were you going to continue on and talk about the fair chance ordinance in this, in, in this meeting? Yes. So I want to hear okay. it. Yes. <laughs> I'd like to, if that's something you're going to do next, I just like to stay on for that discussion because I had some comments about what I read in the emails. So, um, so anyway, so Carmen, would you like to start off on this? We're just we're gonna we're gonna move forward. But if 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 you have uh, some comments you'd like to present to us, I'd I'd like to hear them. Yeah. All righty. Um, well, thank you. I think especially um, for the fair chance ordinance, um, what I read, I just want to clarify my understanding. What I read was that it is going to look at restricting 
looking at criminal records um, of potential renters, et cetera, right? So that landlords have some guidance and cannot just take somebody's entire criminal record their entire life and say, I can't rent to you because 20 years ago you were convicted of blah, 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 correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So one, one thing I didn't read in that, I wondered where you stood on this, is that, you know, eviction history, I believe, is actually a civil, a civil vi violation. And so many people are denied housing because they have an eviction history. I wondered if that was part of the Fair Chance Ordinance. I bet you. Carmen, I don't have an answer to that question. I'm not sure if anyone else does in our group, but I don't have an answer to that question. How about Alan Seawall? Alan? Can I answer? Yep, Megan? That's oh. okay. I don't have an exact answer either, but I think this what we what we had sent you to look at is kind of a is a toolkit. And um, you know, it's uh, there's there are lots of ideas in there, but it really is emphasized that each municipality determines the scope of um, what this act wants to cover. We'll cover like the, you know, the type of rental housing, screening restrictions, you know, and procedures and how it's enforced. And so I, you know, I imagine like, you know, that, that is something that we could incorporate into um, a fair chance ordinance, uh -huh. uh, local ordinance. Um, and I want to say, um, after I read, after I read your column yesterday about the, the sort of, uh, disproportionate, um, influence that rental agencies in Northampton have on the screening process of applicants, I thought there was, there was something that re in this current report that was kind of, I thought was interesting because um, one of the suggestions, um, like a remedy for that would be um, to offer, and I'm trying to look up for my notes here, offer like a portable screening report that applicants could use to multiple with multiple landlords um well one that they can reuse rather than having to repay um an application fee to each discrete landlord yeah. and um that's just an idea that i pulled out of the report i thought um the housing partnership might be interested in and i don't know if that's going to require another an ordinance to to implement or not and no. Well, I think that in the in the op-ed, which actually came out this morning, I know this morning seems like yesterday, but I think it was today. Um, one of the things that we just talked briefly about was that the Boston area has some new um, online models of landlords being able to connect with tenants where some of this stuff is done in a way that I don't understand whatsoever but it gets rid of a rental agency screening process. Mm -hmm. But let me just come back to the fair chance ordinance. I really wanna focus on a history of eviction because when you look somebody up and I can do this from home and their eviction history, um, if they were simply taken to court, even if it was resolved in their favor, um, it comes up as under their eviction history. And so all a landlord has to do, and often what they usually do, is just look at that and they see, oh, you know, Karen Smith went to housing court um, for eviction proceedings in 2017 and 2019. She's obviously not going to be a good tenant, where some of those things have been resolved in Karen Smith's favor, but it comes out in a language that is very um, pejorative to the, to the renter. Um, and uh, so I just think that's a really such a super important um, uh, issue for the fair chance ordinance to also consider in terms of 
language. I don't know if it would be incorporated in that, but I just wanted to bring that up. Thank you, um, Barb. Um, counselors, welcome. the counselors present, do you remember if it was to 2018, wasn't there a city resolution about the eviction rights? Um, I, I remember reading an article about it um, in which this was discussed that, that the eviction eviction history carries such a strong stigma that I think Pam Shore said it was like having a scarlet E on your forehead. Um, yeah. So there was, I can't remember the details. I could look on the city council's page because all the resolutions are posted, but I, I, that sounds familiar and I remember that. Ringing a bell, I think it had to do, it was a aspect of some, broader resolution um, and that's that's my guess all right well thank you councillor nash yeah so um uh i have a question for uh carmen so um, and I see that um, the other person has already left. Um, has the housing partnership had a chance to look at this toolkit in greater detail than us? Um, oh, Keith's here, great. Um, yeah, I'm wondering if the, the housing partnership has had a chance to look at this t tool kit to, because um, you guys are gonna be, I mean, I, I expect you guys are going to have a lot more ac expertise to bring to bear on this, and um, and I'm wondering if um, maybe a better way to go about this would be to have kind of turn the toolkit back over to you guys to make recommendations to us. Um, just a thought, and but wondering uh, how in depth you guys have gone into the the toolkit. Um, I, I had not forwarded that toolkit to the partnership. Uh, we're, we're working on uh, some other things right now. Okay. I, I, I imagine they would be interested in it. Uh, I, I did read it today um, and I think it was very helpful. I, I, did, not, I did not know about this um, type of initiative before. Uh, but yeah, uh, 98 pages, is, it's not something I, um, so. Uh, Definitely afford it to them and we'll, we'll start the conversation, you know. Yeah, I just think that that would be a, a great place to start is with you guys doing the date, deep dive on housing and, um, and bring it back to us or to council. Um, but it, depending on how much longer we're, we're going on, because uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit later, but um, if we do continue on, I, I would be very interested in hearing, um, you know, step by step, because I, I mean, I, I, 90 pages, there's a lot we can do in there. And there's probably a step by step thing that we could do um, to slowly, you know, to start incorporating things in a workable fashion. So anyway. Thank you, Councillor Nash. Uh, Megan. So I want to second what um, Councillor Nash said. And I do feel like um, from, with very limited backgrounds um, of this and reading through, just skimming through this whole kit, it, this is a very, it's a very long process to, to develop a fair chance, um, to, develop, to develop fair chance policies and other kind of supportive policies. And um, there, was a, there was a caveat that it's usually you know, um, it usually comes from the work of grassroots organizations. Um, so definitely it would not, um, this is not something that our commission um, would be equipped to do. Um, also, there were, there were a couple of things that, that concerned me about um, how we would implement it here in Northampton. I mean, you know, the, the, the cities that have already taken this, um, much further are Richmond, Seattle, Washington, DC, Newark, um, very different municipalities and very, you know, 
different scope of issues. Um, what their enforcement, the enforcement part of this ordinance is, is, would be really problematic for us because there are two main mechanisms of enforcement. That's administrative complaint process that would be managed by the local government, which does not exist here right now. I know from my work on the Human Rights Commission that we we refer those kind of we refer those kind of complaints onto um, MCAD, um, a state agency, um, or you know the other the other mechanism is um, you know taking taking these cases to court, um, which is very you know resource intensive and also requires a lot of other supports that I imagine a lot of our, of our tenants do would not be able to access. Um, so that's, those are kind of two of my takeaways from, from reading this report that I wanted to add, but that's all. Thank you, Megan. Councilor LaBarge. Um, I wanna thank Megan um, for her concerns. I have to agree with what she's saying. And I also support what Councilor um, Jim Nash has stated. I think that the city councilors also should be working together um, with housing partnership and looking at the language very carefully and also in the direction of our city solicitor, Alan Seawald. Thank you, Megan, very much. Thank you, Councilor Barge. Anyone else? Oh, great. Uh, I, uh, John, I just had a quick question. Yes. Um, the the person with the public comment. Is there any way to? Um, uh, I, I mean, the link to the housing partnership. Uh, so anyone reads these minutes, because anyone that who's that involved or has done a lot of research, I would like to them to come to partnership and and you know get more involved. So um, that could that could happen. That'd be great. Just asking for the link to the housing partnership to be included in the minutes. Did I understand? I think yes, it. yes. Okay, certainly. I just want to say I am hearing Megan loud and clear now. So whatever's, I don't know what's different, but it's great. Yay, thank you. I found this. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Are, are we all am I too loud on discussion around the fair chance ordinance? Thank you so much, housing partnership members, for your you. input on this. Thank you, Carmen. And Keith. Thank you, Carmen. And then, and then she dropped off. She dropped off. Okay. Thank you, Keith. And Patrick, too. I see him lurking around see, there. Huh. <laughs> I'm glad Patrick's here. That's, uh... I guess. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's move on to allowing two families by right in every single family home and neighborhood. Any discussion around that? We've heard from uh, uh, Wayne Feiden at the last meeting regarding this. And uh, we're going to do a follow up with him regarding this. It, it looks like it's uh, it's got to be introduced at some point to um, you know to uh, the council. So any discussion on this from any members, Council Labarge? Yes, um, I have a hundred percent of support of this. Um, I talked with several of my residents within starting Sunday evening and even today. And they think it's a great idea. I do too. I think, you know, you have a single family home, then all of a sudden maybe that your brother or sister or whoever with their families would like to have an attachment to your house. Why not? Why not? Or even if you want to rent it, like Wayne said, you build it, you can rent it. Mm -hmm. And hopefully it would be affordable rent because I'm into affordable housing 100%. So I do not have a problem with having this going through at all. And some of the people I talked to were previous building inspectors right down the line. They think it's a great idea and I do too. And um, it's time for a change. 
Yep. Now you have a single family home and you want to get another income on it. You should be able to build that and have that other income there to help you and your family. So I don't have a problem with this at all. Thank you, Councilor Barge. And uh, I, I, I second what you said, and I appreciate all of you said tonight. So thank you. You're welcome. Any other members? Councilor Nash. Um, yeah, I just, uh, yeah, I fully support this. I, I think that um, in terms of uh, uh, affordability and um, I think it, it's just, it. I think it's a model for creating affordable space and uh, allowing flexibilities for all families to, to stay together, support each other, uh, for, for people as they get older to stay in their, their homes, to uh, divide them up so that they can, you know, that one of the things that Wayne has talked about is, is that um, our, the population of, of Northampton has stayed fairly consistent over the, the last hundred years, even though our development has, has moved way out all over the city. And part of the reason for that is that as we've expanded, we're, we've been building these large units, these large structures. And that as people have moved into the existing structures, they've taken two families and turned them into one families. Right. They've, um, they've built houses that typically um, people 50 years ago, 100 years ago, would have had rather than two people in them, they'll have an entire six family, seven family in them. Um, my wife and I, we've our first house in Northampton was on Bridge Road in a little cape um, out by um, Arcanum Field, and um, and we, you know, we had our two children and me and Dora, and it's a two bedroom uh, cape. Well, we bought it from a family. Uh, well. That, not that family, the family before that had five children in that house. Wow. So parents, seven people were living in that same house. And that was typical. And that, um, that part of what we're supporting here is this idea that we've created all of this extra space and we can use it in different ways and, and create more opportunity for infill within the existing homes that we've created that in many ways are just too big. And um, so extending that across the city to all of the different uh, areas, just, it makes, it makes really good sense to me. Um, so um, that's my thoughts on it. I don't know, do we wanna make a recommendation on this? Um, I know Wayne presented to us and I know it, it does, um, fall into the purview of, of you know, uh, that's that special case of, 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 you know, of people being marginalized, you know, that, um, that this is, this is a change that could improve things. So, um, yeah, I, but I support the idea. Okay. So this what this ordinance would allow, um, building of up to 900 additional square feet, right? As an attachment to a current home. Is that right? Am I understanding that correctly? Um, and which could be like an additional, you know, set of rooms or some kind of bump out. And the idea is that this will create more, more living space or I get you. more affordable, maybe not quite market rate rentals, and also increase it and also densify our our city, our towns more. Okay. Yes. And okay. Who, who, did I, yeah, I, sure. I, I believe our current zoning allows that for nine hundred feet as a right. supplemental apartment. What we're talking about is going beyond the supplemental apartment into two full two family. So instead of having 900 square feet, you could have two four bedroom units side by side or up and down. Right. Oh, okay, so there's not a limit to the amount that can be built. 
only zone zoning. Properties. Right. Council Labar, just your hand up. Yes, um, I have to echo um, Councillor Nash. Um, I would like us to make this recommendation because I support it 100%. It's time, it's time for a change. It's time to make Northampton that change. We need to be able to have families be able to stay in our city. They cannot stay here. They cannot afford it. So is there a motion on the floor to send this to right there. the city solicitor? I'll make that motion. I'll second it. Motion made by Jeff Napolitano, seconded by Councilor Labarge. And we need a roll call, Laura, on sending this to, referring this to the city solicitor. Laura. Um, here I am. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Um, Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor Thorpe. Yes. Member Peck. Yes. And Member Napolitano. Yes. Okay, that has been sent. On to now liberalizing residential in Florence Center in downtown. That was currently in the drafting stage and we heard from Wayne at the last meeting. This is now open for discussion. Any members? Not seeing anyone. Do we want to spend more time on this before we uh, refer this to our city solicitor? Is there more clarification needs, needed? Do we have anything to look at? Does, I mean, I what is there to send to? We had the last time, so. That's it. Hmm. I think the next two, we don't have any. Councilor? Yeah. Uh, Councilor Nash, what were you gonna say? Uh, I. I I'd like to ask uh, Attorney Seawald about the eligibility letter aspect. Um, how that, how, it, how, it, how does that impact or really change the process here? The site, uh, let me just say that I'm not, uh, are we talking about the 40B, the local 40Bs? I'm not sure. It doesn't say 40B on the agenda, but it, that may be it. That's the next topic, I believe. I think we're on we're the right. oh, oh. residential and we're, we're the floor. Yeah. All right. You I'm threw me a curveball. I'm sorry. I'm out of order. I'm on I'm on to the next question. <laughs> All right. I see Councillor Labarge's hand. Councillor Labarge, thank you. Oh. Um, right now, just what Wayne had talked to us about, it's in a drafting process. Correct. Okay, so I have a little problem right now mm -hmm. of saying, you know, what I feel about it. I need to see more. Okay. That's fair. Okay. Uh, Attorney Seawald. I have the same sort of piggybacking on Councilor Barge issue. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what I'm reviewing on these. I can tell you right now before even reviewing the concept of allowing two families in every zone, which is perfectly possible and legal and doable if you could get six votes on the council and the mayor to sign it. Um, I, I don't have anything to review. And, and I'm sure it will come to me at some point because once there, it gets introduced in council, uh, you know, as a matter of course, it gets sent to me to review and make changes before it goes to the uh, legislative matters committee. So, um, you know, I don't have anything to review on on uh, on the two families in every neighborhood and liberalizing residential in Florence Center, both of which concepts are perfectly legal. Thank you, Attorney Sewell. Since there is nothing before us. Sounds that, like he's already sent it back to us. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wouldn't say that just yet. We're not gonna undo what you just did, you know. <laughs> we don't wanna, wanna be reversing. Um, but, I, but I would say on the next two, number four and five, that we, we hold off on that uh, discussion right now. If uh, members are in agreement with that, you know, until we have something more concrete. 
Anyone? Councillor Nash. Well, I'm wondering if uh, this project eligibility letter aspect, if it, I know that Attorney Seawald, I asked him the question and he was already thinking about it. If he has an answer to that, um, as to uh, what that that means. Um, I, I will say that I'm not, no, I'm not the world's great expert on comprehensive permits. I do know that a site eligibility letter uh, is something that has to come from the state and it, and it requires a vast amount of paperwork and money to get that site eligibility, eligibility letter. Uh, I think what Wayne was hoping to do was uh, to allow for uh, affordable housing to be, to be developed through a local process that would not require that site eligibility letter. Um, uh, because the state has very, very specific criteria for, for sites and what sites are eligible. So that is a process that does slow down uh, the production of affordable housing significantly. So could we do that? We, I mean, that we're overriding a, a, a process by the Commonwealth with a local process? No, no again, we're, we're, we're not we're not affecting the state process, we're providing a different process. Now the, the, the question becomes, um, would these affordable units be included in the inventory, inventory of affordable housing for determination of our compliance with 40B? Right. Under 40B, um, we have to have 10% affordable housing. And if we don't, then there's a state agency who could override our local decision-making it also allows developers to develop without um, getting all of their permits from the Zoning Board of Appeals and not having to comply with zoning or any of our local laws. So if you're under 10%, you lose a lot of control in the development of affordable housing. And I'm not saying that you know we will not produce affordable housing, but it, it would be under the control of the state, not under local control. The question becomes if we start developing affordable housing through this process that's proposed, uh, the local comprehensive permit ordinance, uh, would those be included in the state inventory and would we meet our, our state obligation through the reduction of, of this housing? I don't know the answer to that question. So it's almost like we're creating our, our, our own separate framework for affordable housing above it. So the idea is we want to get way above 10%. And, and one of the ways to do that would be to just say, we call it affordable. We have our own affordable process. And it doesn't have to go through all of this state eligibility process that will actually make the make things happen a little quicker. Is that the idea? Correct. Qu quicker and more cheaply. Right. More efficiently. And then maybe at some other point they could be eligible under the state process. But what we're saying is we want more affordable housing. Here's here's our process. Okay, yeah, I, all right. It's an interesting idea. Yeah, you know, once once the affordable housing is developed, I don't see any developer going to the state and going through that process again. I mean, once it's developed, it's developed. Yeah, but I think we always want to have it at some point you know, to have it, you know, when we've developed affordable housing to have it count towards, you know, our percentage of affordable housing. And it sounds like we have to go through this eligibility process to have it count with the, the Commonwealth. Is that correct? Not necessarily. There are other programs out there, um, like the, LIP, the local initiative program. So there are other programs out there. It's not as black and white as that, but it is, uh, it is a process. And this is just something that could um, just help create affordable housing where developers would not go through that state process because it's so Cumberland. Uh, Cumberland. Okay. You're good, Councillor Nash? Yeah, I'm good. And um, that's a good uh, primer for next time when we talk in more detail about this, the, you know, if we get a copy of this ordinance to look over. Okay. 
anyone? Megan? Are all set? Mm -hmm. Marianne, Council of the Barge? Oh, yeah. All I'm, set? I'm fine. I can't see Jeff. Jeff, are you all set? Yep, I'm all set. Okay. Well, we know it's two we're going to be, you know, looking into. So we're going to move on to time frame and possibility of extension or continuance. Um, as you know, we're supposed to have a report that's due by December 31st. And um, we got off to a late start. And now it's open for discussion as to um, a possibility of an extension um, or a continuance. And I'd like to hear from the members as to um, uh, their thoughts around an extension or keeping the same time frame in mind of December 31st. So. Councilor Labarge has a raised hand. Councilor Labarge. Yeah, I don't know how we're going to have this done, completed for the uh, end of December at all, at all. And we still have, like Councilor Nash brought up about the parking fees and so forth like that. To me, that stuff should have been taken out of the way and continued on with all of this. So either which way you want to have an extension, it's fine with me. Um, I think it's great with what we're doing here, but I feel that the other concerns that we had, like with the parking and so forth, the languages being changed, that stuff should have been done also. So that's my feelings. Thank you, Councilor Barge, and we're still going to be working on that. Mm -hmm. Councilor Nash. Thank you, Councilor. Um, that I, you know, we, we have our different buckets, and um, and and in my mind, the the bucket that moves the quickest is bucket number one, and we haven't even fully gotten all of our uh, recommendations from the different departments yet. So we don't we don't know. We haven't got our full responses for bucket one yet, which um, we send off to attorney. Back to it. So my guess is, uh, you know, we, we are, the way things are going, even on those uh, pieces of legislation that I, I can't imagine us having them all back by the end of December, we're talking basically a month from now. So, um, and you know what, I, what I'm thinking, um, Councillor Thorpe is maybe going back, just looking at well, what was the normal timeline went for this select committee in the past? Um, was it in a year? Was it seven months? I don't know what that, that it typically was, but I know it wasn't four months. And um, which is, uh, I actually think we're running at about three and a half months to get all of this done. And maybe that's that's the extension we want to ask for. Um, and although I would defer, I, my one question to Attorney Seawald here is: there any reason that, let's say, our our deadline was uh, the end of February? Um, that the um, the that by waiting that long, it would throw any of these processes off in terms of. Uh, you know, codifying anything. I can't see any any problem. This this is a process that's going to happen every five years. Right. Uh, I presume we could uh, make recommendations in February or March, and or we'll get a report in in February or March, and still have plenty of time for the the council in its deliberative fashion to get through all of them before. The next round of reviews. So um, I, I, I don't. It doesn't affect the the timing in any way, if I understand your question. Okay. In, in the past, uh, Attorney Seawald, um, you've been a part of this process before. Has it been the entire year, or is it tend to be like six months, seven months? What's your memory? I was just trying to look at the the uh, the ordinance. Um, I believe it was that you're organized by July, but I can't, I can't remember off the top of my head. So I'm looking at it. Talk amongst yourselves and I'll find it. Councilor Nash, I believe it was six months because we were already three months uh, behind. 
Exactly. Right. That's what the mayor said when. Yep. Uh, so I believe it's six months. It wasn't a year. Okay. Yeah. I didn't think it would be a year. So, and we didn't really have our, we didn't have our first meeting until October, correct? Correct. Yeah. And then we're running into the holidays now. Yeah. So, uh, and, and so what would be a reasonable recommendation because this does have to go before the council for a request for an extension and that we won't be able to make that we're not going to look at the December 31st deadline so I would like to hear oh well I'd like to make a motion then to extend work by three months and whether you know we can work out the details of that whether we're going to we'll continue to meet bi-weekly or or weekly you know, given whatever in the need is. Um, and I expect that perhaps not all of us can attend every meeting, you know, up to March, but I okay. can I make a motion. Motion's been made by Megan for a three month extension. Do I second. hear a second? Second the motion. Most seconded by uh, Jeff Napolitano. Laura, I'm going to need a roll call, please, on the motion that's on the floor for an additional three months to be added on if the council approves it. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Um, Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Member Peck. Yes. And Member Napolitano. Yes. Okay. That passes and we will, I will see about having that on the agenda to get an extension for three months. Thank you. Next. Oh, there's nothing else. It's just a motion to adjourn. Oh, nope, I'm gonna oh, go back. Could I? Megan. Could we, um, could we make suggestions for the next meeting's agenda? Next meeting is, is it November 30th? Yes. Okay, Monday 30th. Yep, November 30th. So I hear that the DPW may have some suggested uh, corrections to uh, ordinances. Is that right? That's right. Director Lascalia okay. said she had some. Um, I could give her a it. deadline if you guys wanted. Or I could just encourage and prompt her to, if possible, get them to ask. Yeah. That would be helpful. Sure. I'll ask nicely. And maybe attorney. Donna can be available to this. Oh, nope. Attorney Seawald has this hand up, so I got to. Well, you didn't have to. You could have completed your sentence, sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I just want to know what the uh, what the what the committee would like in terms of my review. Do you want me to review them on a rolling basis, or you just want me to review them all and just set a, a particular agenda item for review of all of them after they come in? Or do you care? Would it be difficult for you to review them on a rolling basis? So I, I, I want to, yeah, I'm here to, discussion. sure, I'm here to make it as easy as possible for you. So just tell me how you'd like me to do it. I would like it on a rolling basis also. Rolling basis, that works for you, Attorney Seawald. Yes, that's fine. So Laura, you'll put on a, a recurring agenda item for me to discuss whatever ordinances came to me the, the meeting before. Great. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Are there no. other? Oh, go ahead. Uh, no, go right ahead, Megan. Oh, I wonder if Councillor Nash is going to ask the same thing. Um, did you want to invite a, another agency head to speak to us about parking? Well, I'm not yeah, sure which. I wanted to put parking on the the agenda. I had a, a very lengthy discussion with Nancy Forrestal, that was mm -hmm. um, very helpful. And... Can't hear oh. you. Yeah, I can't hear Councilor Nash. Can't hear you. Oh, sir. What? Did, was I doing what Megan was doing? Can you hear me now? Yes. 
Yeah, that's because you were lean back. <laughs> I was relaxing too much. Okay, so um, yes, inviting Nancy Forrestal would be great. Okay. Thus, um, the way uh, the parking fees kind of stack up and how it relates to the, you know, then they get reported to the registry and um, and how that can all uh, steamroll into quite a, a mess for somebody. <clears throat> the other thing is um, uh, Councillor Shara and I are looking into some changes around um, zoning notifications, uh, zoning change notifications that um, currently that um, people are, uh, that when there's a zoning change or, uh, or a special permit process, the people that are informed are property owners, not residents. And um, that, uh, that um, having a discussion about um, how to more, it, get more people part of those discussions and more democratically include everybody in a neighborhood, just not the, just, not just the property owners. So, um, and I'm hoping to have some, um, some drafts of those to send our way for um, the 30th. Thank you. Megan. I don't have anything else in mind at this okay. moment. Council Lobard. Fine. Jeff. I'm all set. Okay. Do I hear a motion to adjourn? To adjourn. Second. Okay. Motion has been made by Councilor DeBarge, seconded by Councilor Nash. That is it for the evening. Thank you all for being here. Councilor DeBarge. Roll. Yes. Okay. Councilor Nash. Yes. R roll call. Okay. <laughs> Councilor Thorpe. Yes. Meg Member Peck. Yes. Member Napolitano. Yes. Yes. Thank you.